Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. And it's our great pleasure to have uh, Professor Stephen Dooley this week to give us a webinar. Uh, Stephen is an, is an associate professor of energy science in the School of Physics at uh, Trinity College, uh, Dublin. <coughs> he obtained his uh, bachelor's degree in chemistry and a PhD in physical chemistry at the National University of Ireland, Galway. Prior to his current appointment, he held uh, independent academic appointments in chemical and environmental science at the University of Limerick, held a postdoctoral and professional research staff appointments at Princeton University, and worked as a thermal fluid technical specialist at Cummings Engine Company in UK. His principal contributions uh, have been in interpreting and uh, exploiting the mechanisms of chemical reactions occurring in fuel and uh, feedstock conversion devices to improve clean and uh, efficient operation and thermal economic uh, viability. His research has been widely supported by government and uh, industry. Steve, all yours. Okay, thank you, Wenting, and thank you for inviting me. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, our efforts to automate uh, the generation of really small and accurate uh, chemical kinetic models for combustion initially, but also for other reaction kinetic systems uh, or pertinent to energy conversion devices. So this is the first outing for this work. So I hope I can do an okay job. It's, it's quite detailed. The co-authors are my student, Mark Kelly, who's done most of the work and also Gilles Burke, who is the uh, industry sponsor from Siemens Energy. Uh, the motivation of the work is about gas turbine combustion. So most of the people um, listening today will understand uh, the importance of reaction kinetics for combustion devices. And we have this now very well understood uh, systematic way of building these uh, detailed chemical kinetic models. So there are four submodels: a reaction mechanism where we make as close to a complete list of the elementary reactions as we know uh, about. And this makes the, the model size to scale with the complexity of the fuel. So to scale with the fuel molecular weight, but also the number of components in the fuel. So it becomes a real problem in this approach whenever we start to deal with realistic fuels, particularly of liquid uh, molecular weights. So this is actually the, the fundamental term of the exhausting detail that makes it difficult to deploy these models in uh, computational fluid dynamics simulations, for example. With the reaction mechanism, then comes our reaction kinetics. Here is the, the domain of theory and really uh, careful experiments, but we try to understand as much about the molecular thermodynamics and the reaction kinetics of each elementary reaction rate. So this has been the thrust of the combustion kinetics community for certainly the last 20 years. And the, these two aspects here are, are matters of detail. There's a lot of detail to be learned in there and it takes time. After that, we have, as you know, molecular thermodynamics and uh, transport models. These are less of a problem. They're more readily uh, determinable. Um, but the elephant in the room, as I put it here, is that we can make, yes, detailed predictive calculations using this approach. But the cost of those, both in terms of time to prepare and deduce or determine the input terms, but also the time on the machine to compute the calculations themselves um, are problematic. So the developmental time to do this for some fuel or um, other molecule of interest would be approximately 10 years in my experience. And even if we make it, we still have the issue that uh, the detailed model itself is going to be intractable uh, for use in computational fluid dynamics. Um, and even if we can make it small, um, it, it's still undesirable to use a high amount of detail, chemical detail for the CFD world. So this is, if I can put it, an elephant in the room, something that, that we only partially deal with in, in the combustion kinetics community. So a part of the solution to this has been many people on this call have done a lot of excellent work on model reduction schemes. And these really help a lot, uh, but they don't solve the problem. The purpose of the model reduction scheme is to systematically remove uh, the least important detail uh, from the detailed models without compromising uh, the fidelity of the calculation of the model that would result. So the chart here on the right-hand side is for methane. Today, I'm gonna be talking about methane, which is a very good example and a well understood topic by by nearly everybody that we would talk to. This is for methane and we have on the y-axis fidelity 
uh, of the detailed model versus uh, a reduced model that would result and fidelity against two performance indicators of merit ignition delay time in black and laminar burning velocity in red. And what we see on the x axis as we knock out species, the fidelity of the prediction of the reduced model drops dramatically. And that, that, that's the job of, of uh, model reduction methods, such as path flux analysis, which we use a lot. So, what we want to do is really break this connection between detail in the reaction mechanism and the detailed model and the fidelity of the calculation. So the method we're proposing uh, to, to help with this is what we call compaction. And compaction can be understood just as a combination of reduction, mechanism reduction, and mechanism optimiz optimization. So we're hoping that this could be perhaps a powerful learning or what I call a relearning approach. Why not start again uh, to apply the um, methods and implementations of data science in an age of very fast computers. So, so let's see how we can get on with this in the example of methane, is it useful? So the region we wanna operate in for gas turbines um, calculations is something around 10 to 20 uh, species in, in the model size. That's what we're being asked for by our industry sponsor. So a couple of rules and objectives to start with. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna study the sequential adjustment in detail provided by the four submodels that make up a detailed chemical kinetic scheme. And we're giving ourselves a boundary condition that the model that results must be what's called fair. So this is one of the principles of data science. It means the model that's produced must be uh, essentially usable and, and reusable by existing infrastructure. So what that means in our domain, we need to express the model in terms of the Chemkin or Cantera formats. So it has to be plug and play with existing infrastructures. So actually it's quite a dictating um, essentiality because what it means is we're restricted to the Arrhenius uh, reaction rate constant expression um, and we're restricted to the uh, methods of, of solving uh, that are hardwired into Chemkin, Cantera and CFD codes. So in the short term, the objective is to uh, make an automatic data oriented algorithm to minimize the model complexity but also show high fidelity in the calculation of detailed combustion phenomena at gas turbine relevant conditions, just for now. And maybe in the long term, we can move to an unsupervised machine learning algorithm capable of making what we call compact models for a wide variety of fuels or even reaction kinetics and other conversion systems, such as uh, electrochemical reduction of CO2 or in fuel cells. So we've made um, an initial algorithm, we call it MLOC. Um, so it really means toward machine learning optimization of combustion kinetics. There's a lot on the slide, the part of the slide on the right hand side, and I'm going to take you through it piece by piece right now. Okay, so the initial job is to approximate first the reaction mechanism. So we know Wen Ting, Zhao Long Go, and Yi Guan Zhu, and the work of Ed Law and others on uh, mechanism reduction. So we take that off the shelf and we've hardwired it into our code. We use path flux analysis to eat the detailed model and condense it into a severely reduced model in the space of very small species numbers. And we know that when we do that, we've lost fidelity in the, in the, in the calculations relative to what the detailed model was capable of. So we move from methane from a, a big reaction scheme looking like this. We're gonna show results for a 19 species compaction and also a 15 species compaction. We'll focus mostly for our discussion today on the 15 species compaction. So the first job is PFA, very useful for us off the shelf. Okay, after this, we need to make the reaction kinetics. So we need to prescribe those. Now the rule that we're making here is we want to use as little knowledge, uh, detailed knowledge as possible in doing this. We wanna make it as blind a data science approach as we can. So that's the principle, but in practice, of course we have to make some user defined rules about the bounds on certain numbers and how we populate them. So into the severely reduced model, we put what I've labeled here as stupid generation of possible reaction kinetic parameters. Okay, so there are some essential rules for this. I'll give it, give it to you very briefly. Uh, the next step in the algorithm is that we select, so of course there are still a number of reactions coming out of the PFA into the, at this point, severely reduced model. We select by sensitivity analysis, the top 15 important ones for 
automatic optimization. So we make a pre-selection of 15. Then we populate a library of Arrhenius reaction terms um, across very broad ranges of numbers of each of A, N, and EA. And this results in a massive library of potential combinations of, Arrhen of Arrhenius parameters for each reaction rate constant. So it's actually 2.5 by 10 to the 6 is what we allow for each rate constant. And then we combine these combinatorially to make a huge array of potential models. So the analogy that we came up with to explain this is like the kid in the candy shop. And she's allowed to uh, pick 15 candies into a bag, but in each box of candies, there is 2.5 by 10 to the six potential selections. So, so if we run that for all 15 reactions, we get a huge potential Combina number of combinations of each of the reaction rate constant library library that we make. So what we we do have a lot of computational power, but it still takes time to perform these calculations. So we don't test all of those combinations, of course not. Initially, we limit uh, the tests to 80,000, what we call here in this part of the world, at least a bag of candy like this is a pick and mix. So we have 80,000 possible pick and mixes, and these are our model candidates. And then we enter a round of optimization where we evaluate the fidelity of each of these uh, model candidates against detailed calculations from uh, the detailed model. So we do this completely objectively. If I can come over here, I lost my pointer, but the uh, y axis here is uh, it's, it's, a, it's a perfectly stored reactor objective error function. So it just object objectifies the difference between a detailed model calculation, the fidelity of that, and the uh, compact uh, model candidate. So what we need to know is that a value of zero means a perfect model, and a, and a value of one or greater is like really, really terrible, okay? So what we're searching for is one really good model that shows nice fidelity against the stirred reactor. And what, what we know by our experience of that is that that model will have some ingredients or attributes in it that would make make it successful, um, a successful description or an accurate description of the, the actual combustion kinetics of methane. So we know going into this that almost all the models are going to be terrible. So in fact, 99.9% .9 or so are really bad. So the joke is this, this is like a bad candy, like a piece of licorice, but some are really good. Um, so we're searching for something like the winning lottery ticket from Willy Wonka's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And we can see the data on the left-hand side. So the computer is getting slow because there's 80,000 models. Um, some of these, about 200 of the 80,000, show very low stirred reactor objective error functions. So they're a sign that there's a good model. And so what we want to do now is refine um, the range uh, of the scan. So we call this type of data a scan. So this is a coarse scan initially where we, we scan for huge ranges of reaction rate constant. You can see on the x-axis there, it's 15 orders of magnitude. And in the second step, we need to refine that data. So this is the data that comes uh, right out of the code. So apologies for the change in the legends. It actually turns out to be quite hard, hard to chart all of this. But the key step toward making this automatic and toward implementing true machine learning is that this uh, bound refinement given by the green line there is automated. So we have a probability function that selects uh, the range of potential rate constants where um, the high fidelity models showing low start reactor error functions are likely to exist. So this is really a key piece of infrastructure that we built. And just to give an example, um, on the, on the left-hand side here, we would only uh, now scan in our next cycle of calculations, the range of high probability given here by the blue line and by the green bounds. And this is uh, very useful because it, it, it allows us to very densely populate high potential regions. So you can see for another reaction up here, doesn't matter what it is, there are a number of different high potential re regions for combinations of that rate constant in the different models. Okay, so each data point here is an individual model. And there's still some work to be done. You can see for this reaction, it may be a more unimportant reaction, but actually the, the refined range uh, that the code is spitting out 
is giving us really the entire range of potential rate constants. So we're still doing a little bit of work uh, to refine the application of that. But what we do then, we apply that to all 15 uh, initially selected rate constants. Um, and we make a re-refinement -re of each of the potential, the high potential rate constant values. So we implement another round um, of scanning. So we apply another 30,000 models. So instead of having to do this by eye, it's automated. And the chart that I had previously shown will now we'll apply another 80,000 models to it. And now we really densely populate and have a better knowledge of what the high potential regions are. So at this point, we've spent 160,000 model calculations. So 160,000 different models have been calculated and we're honing in on the really high potential candidates that will have a high efficacy or potential high efficacy to, to describe methane combustion to high fidelity. So the analogy to be used here, what we're searching for is what we call the genetic seed. So a model that has the attributes in it that would lead to good uh, performance in methane combustion descriptions. So we're trying to pick the cherry. Okay, so the exact cherry that we would pick here, there are four or five candidates in the end of that 160,000 that show really good uh, predictive fidelity against third reactor calculations. And we select the one uh, that is best, and then we uh, use its attributes and populate across narrower regions of parameter space, the rate constants uh, of that model. So we're trying to pick the cherry. Okay. So then we get down to the bottom of the algorithm here, and this is what we have. We have at this point spent, we do one more round, we have 160,000 plus 80,000, 240,000. In the third scan, we're making here a Gaussian distribution of really densely populated um, model of rate constant parameters across the, what we call the genetic seed, so the cherry that we have chosen. And what we get is the performance on the left-hand side. So the black data there is we're using a, a base model from NUIG Galway. Uh, so whatever the latest and greatest was at that time of this work, so about the last year or so, the black symbols are the detailed model calculations. And then the blue data is coming from the genetic seed calculation. This is what that looks like. And all of this is completely unseen. Okay, so this is just derived from the stirred reactor data. So the blue model does some way and reasonable replication of the methane burning velocity. But look at the pink model. The pink model is the one that results from 240,000. And it's the best one out of all of that. And it does considerably better. And they all do very good against uh, ignition delay. So these are just examples of data. There's a full parameter range of performance conditions that have been defined by the industry partner. And we objectify all of that um, in terms of fidelity indices for each of the stirred reactor ignition delayed time and burning velocity. So at this point, if, that, if that's good enough agreement for you, um, then we're done, we can stop the model and you have made it automatically a, what we call a compact model for methane. And we were, to be honest, a little bit disappointed here. We were under the impression given the prevalence of stirred reactor data for model reduction that if we were to replicate stirred reactor data, we would do a very good job uh, against a burning velocity. So we have some problems, it's not the case. So there's a second round. So the problems we have um, in making this uh, better and more accurate are in the definition of what we call the objective error functions. So how we summarize uh, the fidelity in stirred reactor performance, how we relate that to fidelity in performance against ignition delay or against burning velocity. So up on the top right hand chart there, this is the stirred reactor error function on the X plotted against the ignition delay time on the Y axis. And you can see that there's, you know, there's a distribution at low values of uh, high values of stirred reactor error function. So remember zero is perfect. Um, but whenever the stirred reactor error function gets low, we do see that we have a good probability of having a very high fidelity in ignition delay time. So that's the type of arrangement we would be Certainly that can be improved, but we will be happy with that. It's useful to us. The type of arrangement that is not useful to us is what, when we use the stirred reactor error function to, um, as a proxy indicator of the burning velocity. So this is the type of information we have here. Basically, 
entirely useless, no dependence between the two at all. So this is a matter of further work for us because we would like actually the algorithm just to run on zero dimensional calculations. Um, but given uh, the situation on the right hand side, uh, we actually have to enter a round two of optimization. So round two of optimization, I won't labor it with you, but it's exactly copy and paste of the process uh, for phase one optimization. Phase one was for stirred reactor. Phase two is direct optimization against the laminar burning block. So we go through the, all the steps again. It's another uh, 80,000 times four, actually numbers of models. So that's 30, 320,000. Um, and here, a lot of the models are bad. So we actually select around the top 2,000 out, out of each cycle. And the type of information we're getting is exemplified on the left-hand side, where the laminar burning velocity error function, again, a value of zero was perfect. And a small number of the models tested have you know, very good laminar burning velocities. So we perform a coarse scan followed by a refined scan. And here we're just charting this against one rate constant. So it turns out, surprise, surprise, the code is able to learn that if you want to replicate the laminar burning velocity with this methodology, the effective rate constant, so these are not actual rate constants now because we have corrupted the mechanistic component of the model. So it's, it's really just an indicator of the exchange of these two species, the conversion of those to these. Uh, but if you want to get the laminar burning velocity right, as we all know from combustion theory, you need to have a very accurate answer or knowledge of H plus O2 chain branching. So it's reassuring that the code also identifies uh, that effective rate constant as being really important. So we make a chart like this, and we do a, a further number of cycles of refinement of that to really zero in on the combinations of rate constants that replicate the laminar burning velocity to very high fidelity. Okay, so we, as I say, do that a couple more times, and now we're down here at the bottom. So now we have an optimized model where we've given the, the, the model relatively little specific information. The information we've given it is what its performance needs to be. In the example that I've shown, talked about today, the performance information has come from exorcision of the detailed model. So we started with methane because it was important to the gas turbine people, but also because we knew it and it would be a good candidate to learn from. But you could imagine another scenario where we optimize directly against experimental data. And that will work as long as we have enough experimental data to test to. Okay, so it's the same as detailed model development. But at the end of the cycle, um, you get this kind of uh, predictive accuracy. So we would have started with, at the end of phase one here, a very poor agreement for an unoptimized model, but with the 15 species, uh, the degrees of freedom available to 15 species, uh, both the genetic seed and the final optimized model show really, really nice replication of the laminar burning velocity and the ignition delay. And you can see it here, the fidelity indices parameterized across broad ranges of conditions. Uh, so these are numbers of equivalence ratios Number, numbers of inlet temperatures um, and also some pressures. So it looks like uh, by the end of the cycle, we have produced a useful model. So just some pieces of detail for you now. So comparison uh, against some literature work. There are instances of this type of work in the literature from for, for quite some time. Uh, so the DRM models that are derived from GRI MEC um, have the same essential procedure. Uh, the learning from reading the literature is that there, there's not actually a procedure that is written down to do this, um, it seems. Uh, this is done largely by hand. Um, and so what we've been trying to do with the MLOC algorithm is really rigorize the method and make it robust so that the, the algorithm itself could eat any model over any range of conditions and hopefully produce this compaction at the end of the day. So we're wondering about how we're doing. So we've made this table. So this is about, the table is about accuracy and then the figure is about computational cost. So what we see are, we've done this three times. We've done it for um, two different detailed models uh, from the same manufacturer, if you like, Henry Curran and Galway, who we work with. Uh, two different detailed models, but they actually have different behaviors. Um, so we've seen that the model can swallow different behaviors in different models. 
and the, the dynamics of how the algorithm behaves that are actually quite different. Um, and that's a very detailed story that we might tell another time. Uh, but we perform, we've performed it three times now. So we have a 15 species model and a 19 species model from one NUIG parent model, and then a 15 species model from a second NUIG parent model. And what we see is that the code is essentially able to produce the same performance indexes whenever we give it the same degrees of freedom, no matter what the detailed model uh, identity is. The second piece of information that would be interesting is when we give it more degrees of freedom that would be available for say, uh, for example, here a 19 species model, we, we do see that the model fidelities, it's easier for the model to find, a re, for the code to find a really well performing model. So you can see there, if you give it 19 species, you're getting 94 and 96% fidelities against the detailed model calculations. So that's something with conventional reduction mechanisms you're not able to do uh, because once you go for methane below about 22 species or so, um, you're not any more modeling the reality. There's not enough detail in the model for reduction to take effect. So compaction is a way for, of compromising, um, of, of undoing that compromise between detail and accuracy. So we compare against the literature. Uh, there are some works uh, on here. And the thing to say, uh, just to, to be careful, each of these different methodologies is really on, usually only concerned with one specific performance characteristic. So for example, the Luca et al stuff is um, concerned with replicating the burning velocity and stirred reactor profiles. Uh, the Lelagian stuff uh, principally concerned with burning velocities and likewise this Lutras stuff. Um, but note that these models are smaller in dimension. Okay, so it's not a complete apples to apples comparison. Uh, but but you're, you're getting the idea. Hats off to the people uh, involved in DRM, so-called 19 and 22. There's actually 21 and 24 species in those respectively. They did a really nice job. Uh, both of those models by the same performance uh, criteria we set here. Um, you know, they really replicate the calculations of the detailed model. But remember that they're using more detail to do that. So they have more nodes um, in the reaction network than we have in our 15 and 19 species models. And what matters in the end is the computational cost. So the, th the three models we produced, basically we start with something up here, with a really high computational cost, a detailed model, and the code is able to, with really very little user uh, time, is able to squash that down to you know, fractions of what it was before. So we're at something like, uh, so we're normalized to GRI DRM 20, 24 here, which comes from GRI MEC. So if that's 100% computational cost, we're at like 59, 57, and 78% or so. So just a little bit more detail on that before I wrap up. We're wondering um, if this is robust. So it's it's been in existence for about a year. Uh, we've been testing it. Um, its experience so far is that it's been exposed to two detailed models. Um, is there a question? Did I see a hand? Do them at the end? Yeah, let's do it at the end. Cool. I was saying that it's, it's been exposed to two detailed models. And uh, the analogy here is of the candy shop and of it's eaten the two detailed models. Um, and it has expressed them successfully as really re uh, reduced, highly reduced compacted models of 15 species and 19 species. So it would appear to be robust, at least within the framework of methane uh, combustion phenomena. Um, but we're mindful that you know the, the what I've written here is that the proof of the pudding is is in always in the eating. So we need we need to let the code eat more puddings to see if it can digest them. Um, so that means more reaction chemistries and different performance characteristics. So right now, what we've been interested in is replication of these kind of macroscopic indicators, burning velocity ignition delay and stirred reactor species profiles, um, also uh, flame structures. So you can see the numbers there yourself. Um, it gets better with each round of optimization and it always looks pretty good. And then the example of how it looks in the real world, uh, th this is for the model that we developed on. So it's given this long NUIG code name from 2018. Um, so the, the phase one optimized model looks like that. Over here, when we change the detailed model identity, uh, the, the two things change. 
So the encouraging thing was that when we changed the detailed model identity, actually the calculation of the detailed model for methane combustion changed. Um, so the code was able to compensate for that, it was able to handle it, and it was able to essentially make a similar level of fidelity, 79% at the same stage um, as we experienced for the model that we developed on. And then in, in the second stage, so, so at this point, coming back to the blue lines, this has only seen stirred reactor profiles. It hasn't seen any, any flame structures. Um, and at phase two, the red lines are whenever the model has seen the flame structure. So when we optimize directly to the flame structure, so it's able to replicate things quite well. So that's it. I didn't want to speak for too long on your Saturday mornings or nights. Um, you can see what we're trying to achieve. Um, we're, we're still work in progress. Uh, there, there's a paper on this uh, com, coming out in a, in a week or two at the ASME. Um, what we see from our experience so far is that the approach might be useful. So we're trying to use as little knowledge as possible and use, use basically blind data science and use the power of the computer and the computer's time rather than the time of the human. Um, so this, we started this work around this time last year um, so what we see is that it's probably quicker than doing this uh, from theory and experiment, you know, from hand building these things in a detailed way. Definitely less human effort is needed, but, but more machine effort is needed. And we think we might be able to use less knowledge to make our models without knowing as much about the world of molecular thermodynamics um, than, than we have been using to date. And then the prospect that I see is that this, this, these methods could be generalized uh, in the machine age, um, that genericized, um, so to describe things like fuel cells and electrochemical reduction methodologies and other things, uh, devices of that nature. But of course, we have to be cautious, uh, very limited experience with it to date, and we don't know how it's going to do against a system of different complexity um, and, and different uh, connection between uh, detail and performance. So for sure, we've seen uh, model stiffness is an issue. Uh, so right now, the stiffness is inherently handled um, almost inadvertently by uh, the phase two process. If, if, the, if we cannot get a solution in a few number of attempts, we just discard the model and we move on to the next one. So this is sort of like a very crude screen against a potentially stiff solution. Um, so we just don't go there. Um, but then we have definitely problems for large models um, because large models for dimensional calculations, uh, one dimensional calculations like the flame structure, large models will be difficult uh, to solve. Um, and also Wenting and Zhailong Go and Iguan, PFA has a problem swallowing the large models. And that's, a, the, that's important for us because it's our front end. So we may need some help from you there. So we see potential. So to acknowledge just some funding, um, Science Foundation Ireland, who, who sponsored the program and also Siemens Energy. Uh, the graduate student who did the work is Mark Kelly, um, worked very hard on this, and also uh, Gilles Burke contributed from uh, Siemens Energy. So that's what we have. Thanks for listening. So Winting, I was in pretty good time. I hope you were able to follow everything. Yes, Steve, thank you very much. So here, uh, I collected a few questions from the audience and the first from Professor G. Gore. He is asking, what do you feel is the key to unlocking MLOC from a 3D transient simulation of a practical gas turbine combustor? If I understand the question. Uh -huh. um, so our, our brief, so this, this work is defined by Siemens gas turbine. So the brief was to give um, some model for natural gas combustion actually between, between 10 and 20 species. And the freedom that they gave us at the time of conception was that uh, you, uh, as a degree of freedom, you can give a different model for different equivalence ratio mixtures. Um, so that was the performance envelope. So if I understand the question from Jay, um, to, to make this really applicable for gas turbines, what we need to do is drill further down um, into the species on the envelope. So we're, we developed off a target of 15, you know, not to make the thing too difficult for us. Um, but you can see some of the other attempts in the literature, uh, 14 species, um, and maybe there's one or two lower as well. 
um, we should say that this, this table of literature, all of these are what we call FAIR. Uh, their Kimkin format can be plugged directly in to a CFD calculation without any messing around with um, solvers or the format of the mechanism. So that's really important. So that, that is a key. Whatever we make has to be uh, readily usable. We can't be messing around with the format of it. Um, but the, the specific answer to the question is smaller, smaller levels of dimensionality. So let's, after this, maybe we can try a completely artificial reaction network, as we call it now. It's not a mechanism anymore. Why not put together a reaction network that has only nine nodes or 10 nodes and see if MLOC can swallow that or what the, comp the compensation between detail and fidelity is for that one? All right, um, still the, the following question is also from Professor Jigar and from data science perspective. Is it not important to have a model that is independent of the starting point? Or in other words, is the starting point important? The, the starting point here being a detailed model? Um, probably. Yeah, so look at that, absolutely. So we've, in, in development here, conception, we've taken uh, the opportunity given to us by 50 years of work on methane. So we knew we knew we were able to know a lot about that. Um, so it was a, you know, a good place to learn how to do this. Um, but the, the view here is that instead of using uh, independent of the starting point, instead of, instead of using um, information from a detailed model, of course, uh, we can apply this directly to experimental characterization of the event itself. So if, if that's what's meant by independent of the starting point, then that's really important. And that's where we need to go to now. Uh -huh, thank you. And following question is from Professor Yu. And the objective error function seems to be not very sensitive to the rate of methyl plus O2 in one order of magnitude. Is this temperature and pressure dependent? And you may say, you know, I have an uncertainty of 20 to 30 percent from theory, and why not use the theory data as a starting point? Uh, good question. Um, not a yes or no answer. Um, I'm trying to bring up the slide. The machine is too slow. So, it, so the, the the issue is that so if if we know theory, we can put that in. Okay. Now, what we've done here in selecting the reaction rate constants, there's, there's actually, we had to make some decisions. So what comes out of uh, PFA is our front end. So what comes out of PFA is the, call it initial guess, is the existing rate constant that was in the detailed model. So information of theory is already built into that one. And then the loss is that that, that reaction rate constant is no longer directly applicable to the network that we're trying to just apply it to. But the answer to your question, Professor Ju, is that the activation energy is still a physical activation energy. And then we've set a bound on how much that activation energy can change. Um, so that is knowledge from theory. Right now, the bound for activation energy, for example, it's plus or minus 50%. Um, now we have no reason, real reason for choosing that, but we have to give a, a range of bounds to the code so that it wouldn't have a completely infinite number of possibilities. So the answer to your question is that information from theory, when it's easily available, so machine learning methods to compute barriers, all of that, they can come in here. But the issue is that up, up here in the, on the right-hand side, it, I kind of glossed over this if I can go back, but we're no longer talking about a reaction, an actual physical reaction mechanism that would be occurring in real life. So once we break, uh, pass through the bottleneck there in, fit in, in uh, detail versus fidelity. This is actually a, an artificial rendering of what the reaction mechanism is. It's not real. Um, so here we start to transition from the world of physical science theory and, and fundamentals into sort of a, a data realm where these species are no longer species. They're really nodes in a network. So I think that course, there's, they're still representative of, of what's happening. Um, so, you know, the conversion of CO to CO2, it makes sense that a very good initial guess for that should still be the initial guess that will come from theory. So all of that can be put in, and actually it already is in, in the context of this example, um, from the knowledge hardwired into the detailed model. 
Uh, thank you. I think that uh, for a very uh, small reduced mechanism, so that the accurate rate constant for a certain elementary reaction may not be necessarily a, that the same as the uh, best theory can predict. That's what you try to say, right? Uh, that, that's another can of worms. So, of course, theory has its own uncertainty, right? So, we haven't started to look into the uncertainty of this, but what this is, it's a probabilistic approach, right? So, remember that each model that's produced has different combinations of the rate constants. But the test of your question would be, it would be the following. We take the example of H plus O2 chain branching. Would this code deduce the experiment, you know, the recommended value, Bolch or whatever the latest is, for H plus O2 chain branching? Um, and then we could really get in. So it, let's say that it met, a, it met a close recommendation for that. Then you could really get into strong argument about uh, the relative uh, uncertainties in theory versus the relative uncertainty in a probabilistic data oriented approach like this. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Bill Peace. Uh, DNS researchers talk about a stiffness reduction in the reduced kinetic model. The stiffness causes the solver to run more slowly and have you thought about this issue? Yes. Uh, so stiffness is the thing on a horizon from, uh, you know, day one. Now we're developing, right? This is early stage. Um, so we're worried about stiffness. We're always benchmarking. So if we select uh, so this game that we're playing here, it's about the selection of these, what we call genetic seeds, right? The cherries. Whenever we select a genetic seed, um, where am I going? Whenever we select a genetic seed, uh, that genetic seed is characterized for performance attributes that, that, that we need to have in the successful model. And stiffness is one of those. Uh, so we perform some benchmarking at the point of each cherry picking uh, moment uh, to make sure that there's nothing, well, to screen. So we're not making sure the code is doing this uh, to check um, that those attributes would be in an acceptable level of performance tolerance. So that's my answer, a little clumsy. Stiffness is important. We're checking for it. Um, we don't have uh, explicit uh, tests um, within the algorithm right now, other than if the code finds a hard time to solve, it, it just gets rid of the model and chooses the next one, goes into the garbage can. All right, thank you. Um, next question from one of the audience, Bill Rack. Um, is it really better to start the search with some total random uh, random, uh, random math um, Arrhenius parameters instead of concentrating on the region around the original grid coefficients and the parameters? How do they correlate? Do they correlate at all? Yes, uh, okay. so. So this is a similar question to Professor Ju. Um, let me come out of this. So it, that, that, that comes down to how badly you have corrupted the reaction net, so using two words, reaction mechanism or reaction network. So if you have, so it, when, when, when squeezing the detail all the way down in the context of PFA here, if you're down at 10 species, you don't have enough physical information in that reaction network to just describe the reality of the physics. So in that case, actually, probably the, uh, the actual reaction rate constant that you're talking about now, um, that's probably a poor initial guess because it's pinned. That is only relative to the fidelity of the reaction mechanism in my viewpoint. Um, so the answer on that one is, for a, a more like uh, a, a more uh, lifelike approximation of the reaction mechanism, then absolutely the, the real reaction rate constants are a good initial guess. But if you've corrupted that, you know, very badly to the point where uh, maybe you've gener we could do this by generating a completely artificial reaction network, then the reaction rate constants probably are not a good place to start. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Professor Xiaolong Go. 
uh, how to deal with the relationship between reduction and uh, optimization in the kinetic model generation process? I hope I just explained that. <laughs> so uh, reduction, oh, I, I understand the question. Um, the, so as, far as, as long as I understand, so there's two components. You reduce and you make a reaction network and that can be one configuration or it could be any, any one of a number of other configurations. Um, and then you have a second component where we optimize. So what we've seen so far, so, so the question is about whether you optimize the reaction network or do you optimize the reaction rate parameters? So what we've been doing so far is uh, setting the kind of assumption that actually the things that we need to optimize are the reaction rate parameters. If we give those a broad enough degrees of freedom, optimization searching of those terms will uh, give us high fidelity. But you could take another view that it says, what we really need to optimize is the reaction network. Um, and that's a valid question um, that we haven't jumped into, you know, in a, in a very parametric or studied way, but it's in our minds. Um, and so what I've tried to show, we've done this, the comparison between both of these networks, 19 species and 15 species. So those are different reaction networks. So you could say one is more optimized than the other, one is also bigger, um, but it's easier to find a good model uh, when, we have only nine, when we have 19 species, 19 nodes, than it is when we have 15. So there is definitely a piece of work to be done on the optimization of the reaction network, the nodes and the connections. I think that was the question, one thing, if I understood it right. Yeah, thank you very much. So next question is from Stephen, Dr. Stephen Kripenstein. And how physical do the networks end up being? For example, how many orders of magnitude to the network rate constants vary from the mechanism rate constants? Are your reaction network connections uh, the same as in the reduced model or different? Yes. Um, good question that we've thought about and have not uh, got an answer for you on that yet. So it's in. I mean, we, we just, Stephen Clinton said, we just have not been thinking about it uh, in, in those terms, actually. So, of course, there's a reaction rate constant in the compact model. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll chart those up against the equivalent terms in the detailed model and we'll send it to you. Um, that's something that has, has been on my mind and we just haven't done. Okay, thank you. Um, next question from the audience. It seems like there is a clustering in the objective error function uh, on slide 11 at 1.5. Is there an explanation for that? Uh, this slide, uh, there's a clustering um, the, up here, I guess. Um, so, at so one this... point five, I, uh, I'm not sure I, uh, I know it exactly. Okay, the, I mean, the issue is about the objective error functions. Um, so, so we had to objectify this somehow. Um, and so, we, you know, we went, uh, you know, onto pen and piece of paper, and then we went to the literature. What you're seeing um, is that we want to use third reactor profiles. They're easy to compute. We could use something else. Um, but the purpose is to make an easy calculable quantity relatable to a quantity that's difficult to calculate, like the flame. Um, so what we see when a zero dimensional system, the third reactor fidelity error function, whatever you want to call it, does relate to the ignition delay uh, error function. So when you get one right, you get the other one right. Um, as long as you get a uh, good enough replication of the stirred reactor performance itself. So that's why there's a clustering because the essential physics of each environment is similar um, in the case of ignition delay time to perfectly stirred reactor as we're using it. But this is in the case uh, for how we're relating the burning velocity to the perfectly stirred reactor information. So I'm putting out a call for help on this. This is a problem of combustion theory. I kind of astonished that uh, we scour the literature and I stand to be corrected. We can't find a relationship in the literature that relates third reactor information or you know, zero dimensional information to uh, burning velocity information. 
So maybe that's there, but we haven't been able to, to find it. And I, I just haven't had time to go and do the work to, to think about that and derive something. What we're doing right now, I mean, I put this up on purpose. This one on the bottom right is the absolute worst one, right? Which is the first one that we used. We have got something a bit better than this now, um, but disappointingly from you know, a combustion scientist person like myself, we've used a data science approach uh, to per perform, to extract a relationship that is useful, but not good enough yet. So I'm not sure that answers the question, but some words about the error functions. We need to make them better. Okay, thank you. Last question from uh, the, uh, one of the attendees from uh, Dominico. Slide 23 shows time of computation. What is determining the CPU time? Is it size or is it stiffness instead? Would advanced time integration like uh, multi-rate methods be helpful here? Yes, right, so of course. Um, so be better methods um, of performing the calculation. Um, uh, this, 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 the solver itself um, make all of this a lot better. Um, but you know, the, I think that the information that is important to me then when I, we bring this to you know, the gas turbine people and they always want it to be better and smaller and faster anyway. So it's not like we can solve this by just throwing the bigger computer at it. It's still gonna cost time and they would still like to have the smallest model that, that they can have so that they can perform the calculation nice and quickly. Thank you very much. That's all the questions. Yeah, and before we finish, and uh, one more uh, one uh, reminder, and there will be a time change next, starting from next week, because the U.S. is moving to the daylight saving. So we're gonna uh, 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 put our clock one hour forward uh, on Sunday morning. 